Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. The fifth Sunday after Pentecost falls on June 27th, 2021. And the texts are these. The thematic first reading is Lamentations 3, 22 through 33. The semi-continuous first reading is 2 Samuel 1, 1, and then verses 17 through 27. Psalm 30, all of it. The second reading is 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 15. And the gospel text is Mark 5, 21 through 43. So as we mentioned last week, we have passed over the healing of the Gerasene demoniac and have, uh, and have moved to this story uh, as the boat has crossed to the other side and uh, one of the famous or very well-known rhetorical devices of Mark of this intercalation of two stories and, and what difference it makes that these two stories are told together, uh, both for meaning for both of them and uh, homiletically. So where are you two dropping down this time with this remarkable story? I, I, I sure, I'm sure glad they cut off, uh, cut out the story of the Gerasene demoniac so that because we needed one more week of John 6 in August. Uh, exactly. Otherwise, you wouldn't get through the bread of life. Well, or you could just go faster. <laughs> I do think you missed something in this story, though. So. Last week, he crosses the, over the other side, he gets there, interacts with foreigners, you know, uh, th there you have a foreigner who wants to follow him after the healing, and Jesus says no, and he sends him back, as, you know, uh, to tell, strangely to tell uh, about what's happened to him, and now he comes back over, uh, back into Jewish territory. I just think that's helpful context for this story then where you get him uh, running into uh, right, right away. The first thing that happens is a, Jairus, uh, he's got a name. He's a leader of the synagogue. He's male, but his little girl is at the point of death. And then on the way, um, on the way to help the little girl, help Jairus, uh, this woman touches him and he stops. Mm hmm mm hmm That I feel like everything I want to say about this, I've probably said three years ago, six years ago, nine years ago. I, I no wish Joy remembers. were able to, if Joy were here, she'd have something new to say. But, you know, there's uh, some preachers have to unlearn some stuff to, to deal with this passage. You've, you've got to, uh, if, if you've been taught that Jesus somehow shows utter disregard for the law here or somehow willingly defiles himself and, and breaks the law, that then you've, you've missed something. Um, the passage doesn't draw any attention to that. So maybe we'll come back to that in a bit. But mostly this is a story about life, uh, all parts of it, not just the 12 year old girl who's brought back to life, uh, but also the woman with the hemorrhage and, and what it means for her to experience life. And to pay attention to her condition. Um, David Schnassa Jacobson describes her as being participled uh, with all mm -hmm. the participles describing her that, you mm -hmm. know, she's the, the care she has sought out from the so-called experts has made her sicker and broke. And she appears to be at her last chance or doesn't really know, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know if she recognized there'd be other chances or not, but she just thinks if I just touch the hem of this guy's garment, that's all I'm going to need. So there's an act of desperation there that Jesus refers to as faith. Uh, and it results in, in her healing, which is a, uh, which is a real thing. And it's a chronic condition. And I, I think in that society, it, it uh, in a, obviously in a patriarchal society and a society then where motherhood is so incredibly important for a woman's identity, it, it now um, uh, perhaps makes it possible for her to have children or children again or something like that. There's a sense in which this is about her capacity to be a life giver and a life bearer is restored. I don't want to say that's all that she's good for. I hope people recognize the, you know, the cultural difference there, but um, but that's part of it too. And then for a 12 year old girl to be restored, there's a sense in which the things that make for human misery 
and for the destruction of human well-being, not just for individuals, but for societies, that kind of stuff's getting reversed or it's getting utterly transformed in the presence of Jesus. And in one instance, without him really even knowing what's going on, or at least not, not having the kind of agency that we see in the other healing stories. It just, it's an agency that's not even conscious, yeah. I, you which know, speaks when, to the power within him. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, going back to the, the fact that the Gerasene demoniac is skipped, you see these, what you, what you see in these rather surprising characters uh, compared to the disciples, so you have the Gerasene demoniac, you have the you have uh, Jairus, and then you have the hemorrhaging woman, all responding to Jesus in ways that recognize his power. So you have you know the demoniac uh, worships him, right? He 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 uh, when he sees Jesus. You have Jairus falling at Jesus' feet, and then you have the woman she just heard about Jesus. And so those, you know, that's, I think that's another important aspect of this passage is that you, that you, that you have these encounters where people are, have not witnessed necessarily Jesus, they haven't witnessed what the disciples have witnessed. And so, uh, and yet recognize Jesus authority. I think the other, you know, one of the other uh, striking things about always for me for this passage uh, and maybe it's more so coming out of COVID, is uh, the, the, the tension or the contrast between the pressing of the crowd and, uh, and yet the, uh, the power of touch and, uh, and, and that emphasis on touch. And uh, th that for me is, I don't know, is, is something that is uh, so striking in this passage of of not only Jesus recognition but just that just as as her own uh, her own commitment to uh, or her own um, sense of trust in that touch I just find that to be uh, I find that to be very moving and it's again it's named as <clears throat> excuse me it's named as faith right it's not mm -hmm. yeah it, it doesn't appear that either of these, people, or even to go back to the Gerasene demoniac, has to undergo some kind of a confession of faith to, yeah. you know, to name Jesus correctly or things like that. They, it's not like they know exactly who he is, mm -hmm. nobody else does, but their, their response to him, which are responses of desperation, but also there's a confidence there. There's a belief that this might be it, right? This might be mm -hmm. what I've been looking for that that is named as faith, I think is really important to lift up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sometimes faith, sometimes faith means you can doubt your way through the recitation of a creed, right? Or, or be cynical about certain things being said in different parts of a worship service. But the fact that you're there says something. The fact that you got up and you came that morning says something. Or the fact that you're looking for a miracle, whatever that might mean to you, says something mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. what this gospel um, commends and, mm -hmm. and the kinds of people attracted to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you see that in those verbs of, of, uh, of that falling at Jesus feet or to go back to the garrison demoniac of worshiping. And so that act of simply, as you noted, Matt, that act of simply uh, being there or that act of, of, of prostrating yourself uh, without really, without really any Ne any conviction necessarily or creedal, creedal background to say, I know what's going to, I know what the result of this is going to be and how much we locate faith in answers and uh, certainties. And what we, and what we get here is not that. Uh, and, and that, that, and her persistence in reaching out, I cannot help but think about um, having been to Magdala, uh, uh, well, Magda, I went to Magdala since this story, you know, since this story has come up in the lectionary and there that you've been there too, Matt, that mural of in the basement of the, of the church there. 
of, of her, you know, her hand reaching out to touch Jesus cloak. And then there's like this light shining on the, you know, shining on his cloak. And it's just like that one little moment of that, that, that changes your life. And that, 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 uh, that moment here of, 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 of she's healed, but also just in that, and we've talked about this before, but just in that one, that uh, addressing her as daughter uh, is that is signals that restorative, how much restoration is happening here uh, that you mentioned before, Matt, that it's not just healed of this, this condition. Uh, but the way in which it's just a, a moment of resurrection for her from death to life in terms of all kinds of possible relationships and, and her own identity. And so that, you know, she tells her whole truth and yet now she's able to live into a new truth. Uh, I, I find very powerful. And that's what happens in that one moment of touch. Uh, that 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 again crossing thresholds that we've been talking about in in Mark of a threshold from death to life a threshold from uh, really non-existence or a, a certain kind of truth uh, that excluded you to perhaps to a truth that that brings you to wholeness I think there's a lot that you can do homiletically with that yeah yeah it, people should uh there's two things I want to say in response to that. One is people should look for that that mural, that painting, if, if yeah. they haven't seen it. I think if you Google Magdala yeah. woman hemorrhage, probably it will come up. <laughs> um, but one of the things that makes it so striking is the the perspective as you're at ground level. Yeah, exactly. Just seeing feet and bottoms yeah. of robes. Yeah. So you have to know where to look to see the action in this story because yeah. it's not. And there's so be... many feet. <laughs> exactly, but yeah. you, you're not going to see this in faces or in the places we're all trained to look at people. You have to see what's happening at ground level, which is yeah. powerful. The second thing is a, a preacher might want to think about the relationship between curing and healing, mm -hmm. which comes up a lot in biblical studies. Uh, in passages about about miracles that um but as well takes its cue from you know medicine and wellness in our in our day and age that the woman's cured when she touches the hem and she knows it mm -hmm. the healing takes place when jesus stops the procession finds her out speaks to her calls her daughter offers a kind of public vindication or kind of a public demonstration that he's the one who healed her which then creates some new possibilities for her life going forward that are different from the cure, right? That might be more social. Um, and so to help people see that, because when we read your faith has made you well, your faith has saved you. Mm -hmm. Those are hard passages for a lot of people to hear when they go home uncured from church mm -hmm. on Sunday morning, right? And some sermons play up the connection between faith and, and miracle to such an extent that all of a sudden people think, well, I must not have any faith because I'm still uncured. And yeah, or not enough. So to think about, yeah, to think about the church's vocation around healing and wholeness is mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. important for a passage like this, I think. Mm -hmm. I think you could add one more layer of that too, uh, uh, which, which is restoration, um, that there's curing, uh, like you said, uh, then there's uh, or healing those that distinction. But some people are healed and restored physically, but not restored communally. Other people are healed, but not restored physically, but can be restored communally, uh, which was really a nice segue to Psalm 30. Uh, one of the purposes, Psalm 30, as yeah, you know, I don't know how, if we've been doing this 12 years, uh, you guys, something like that. Uh, I've said everything I have to say about Psalm 30 and can still. It's still more. fresh. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, that Psalm 30, uh, really my favorite psalm, uh, and I, I wrote on it. I think for um, our other website, Enter the Bible. Probably I have a commentary on the, this website too, but it's uh, it's got it's it's a psalm. Uh, of thanksgiving for someone who has been brought through a crisis by the grace of God and who looks back, but now has come to worship and invites people to praise God with him uh, or with her. And I, I think there's something really important about that, that this is 
one of the ways that we restore people to community after a crisis that separated them from the worshiping community is to praise God on their behalf, uh, to change the prayers for help to, to prayers of thanksgiving, and to, and, to, and, and to really give thanks to God for their healing, which is an act that also then helps restore them to the community. There's these two great lines. Uh, one is verse five, uh, God's anger is but for a moment, uh, his favor is for a lifetime alternately could be translated in his favor is life mm. um weeping may linger for the night and the word for linger means really to uh, stay over for one night we so weeping might sleep over for the night but in the morning it actually just says in the morning joy um mm. and then the other great line here is um you have turned my morning into dancing you've taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy and as I've talked about many times, um, it's an impossible thing. It's the great thing about poetry is you can say impossible things. You can't be clothed in joy. Uh, joy is an abstract concept, but we all know what it's like. We all know when people's faces, demeanors, attitudes, uh, they, w when they're clothed with joy as opposed to being clothed with sackcloth. Mm. What do we do? Thanks for that, Rolf. Yeah, what that's we... great. I think there were things there I haven't heard in the last 12 years. So, oh, thanks. Be encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Lamentations 3, this is another one of those instances where to find a thematic pairing, the lemon, the lemon, lemonary, the lectionary <laughs> drops in this passage out of an incredibly complex book. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose you could preach on all of Lamentations if you wanted to, and that'd be your only focus. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> with this passage being your launching pad, but maybe we just kind of set it into context and talk about divine faithfulness and grief. I don't know, it's... it's. Well, I, I think the other connection could be, I mean, this week I would definitely preach on the Mark, on Mark, because it's such a wonderful story, but another connection could be verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. So you have that you know, you have that seeking, if you will, of Jairus and, and the woman of knowing, knowing or, or having heard of Jesus's goodness, that would maybe be one connection. Is it a problem, though, that the characters in Mark 5 don't, to go to verse 26, they don't wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord? I mean, I guess Jairus has to wait for a bit because Jesus stops and, you know, but. Well, but to what extent the woman has to, has been waiting for 12 years. 12 years. So that might. Well, I or think that maybe we have just, to redefine quietly or what that, what that's. Or like. just skip over that verse and pretend <laughs> it doesn't, it's not there. <laughs> um, it, yeah, the word quietly is not helpful, I suppose, uh, in any sense. Um, going back to last week, Job doesn't wait quietly. Um, you know, uh, people who cry out in all the Psalms of pain aren't waiting quietly. Uh, the Bible does not overall in its witness suggest that while we wait for God's healing and salvation, that we have to wait quietly. Um, the point is the waiting and waiting, waiting and hoping are really almost identical concepts uh, in, in Old Testament Hebrew. Um, so, you know, Psalm 40, I waited and waited for the Lord. He inclined his ear, you know, and, and lifted me up out of the miry bog that, uh, so to wait is to hope and to hope it means to wait. It's the, the bigger problem I have more with this passage of Lamentations is in the entire book of Lamentations, uh, this is like the only hopeful passage. So the one time we're able to go to Lamentations, this book of pain, communal pain, uh, we go there and we jump, we drop down into this uh, really um, you know, the one hopeful, upbeat passage, you know, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mere mercies never come to men. They're new every morning. Mm -hmm. And, and Lamentations, uh, you know, really written probably during the exile um, for uh, maybe, we don't know what for, but, to, but, but to give lament to the unfulfilled promises of God and the de devastation of the people. Um, 
that's it. It's okay for us to linger in the other parts of it once in a while too. Yeah, which is what the commentary, I'll use that as a segue to the semi-continuous, semi which the commentary on the semi-continuous reading invites uh, of a, 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 of a way I invite you to focus this week on grief and its place in the life of faith, uh, which we get in David's lament over Saul and, John, and Jonathan. And so uh, maybe that's the, that's the connection, you know, that you, that you uh, make this time. I just want to use this, this look at, at 2 Samuel 1 to, to show off my copy of the book of Jasher, <laughs> which my, uh, my friend Tim Jones gave to me, I think, for my birthday a long time ago. So uh... it originally came from First United Presbyterian Church in Urbana, Illinois. But this is the book of Jasher, which includes the Song of the Bow. Wow. Which I'm sure Rolf can tell me more about. I could tell you about the Song of the Bow and the book of uh, Yashar. As I, I prefer Jasher. Jasher. It's easier for me to pronounce. It is. It's, it's... You call it Jasher in the Bay Area. Jasher. What's the, up uh, with that? It's a secret book. Secret book. <laughs> what I have to know, uh, what, what else is it? a little it's, symbol down here. That's a secret book. It's a scroll. Uh, I like uh. that. And uh, what, what else is in there? I've never read it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I is realize the prayer, Saul, is, is the is the prayer of Jabez in there? <laughs> I realize it says long lost or undiscovered, now offered in photographic reproduction of the version by Alquin. Anyway, I think it's some kind of a, anyway. I'm going to get myself in trouble, or uh, or somebody from the Society of the Rosy Cross is going to visit me tonight and take it from me. <laughs> well, somebody who, uh, but who, yeah, whoever stole that book from that church i realize i realize i'm i'm taking away the attention from the, the the sadness around the death of saul but um uh, uh really the lament is not for saul but for jonathan mm -hmm. yeah. and so the 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 prayer of uh the song of the bow um you know really is about jonathan and um uh and so this is this is a time when you to talk about grief and mourning and how those are not the same thing you know grief is the emotion and mourning is the work of working through grief and and it's also a time uh, perhaps to talk about uh the friendship um between david and jonathan mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um the other thing is to recognize that you go from the commentary on the website last week to really tried to talk about Saul and Saul's descent into madness, uh, you know, uh, really um, mental illness that happens throughout the, the rest of the book of Samuel. So last week we had first Samuel 17. Um, Reading the rest of the book of Samuel is uh, something almost nobody does. Uh, very few, you know, I think very few Christians know the, the rest of that story and sort of the despicable ends to which David goes at certain points, but also the, the tragedy of Saul's character throughout the rest of the book and his descent into insanity. Um, and then finally his death at the end, the last thing that really happens at the end of uh, 1 Samuel is his death. And then it's reported again at the start of 2 Samuel. And then David, uh, I think in the middle verses, uh, you know, then David puts to death the guy who, uh, the messenger who brought the news because he has taken, he has robbed uh, Saul's body of the signs of kingship which David is both happy to have, but still has to put the guy to death because he shouldn't touch those things. And uh, then you get this lament psalm. And this is, by the way, this, this is truly a lament uh, that within, within Hebrew prayer, there's a distinction between a lament, which is a prayer of grief over death because of death and a prayer for help, 
what we normally, what most people call laments are actually not laments. This is a lament. Mm. Mm. But I, I did appreciate the commentary uh, uh, that of, of that invitation to dwell in that. And, and I think that the, uh, you know, the preacher might want to consider uh, the ways in which you are uh, in your preaching, addressing that on a on a an intentional basis, that the the kinds of uh, losses we've experienced in this last year and a half, and and where is it, and how is it that you're giving opportunity to talk about that, and permission to talk about that, that you know that the fact that we are on you know this side of the pandemic doesn't mean that that grief is gone, or that the work of mourning is is over. As you noted, um, as you noted, Rolf, and that we are going to be, we are going to, to have to navigate the trauma of what's happened for a very long time. And so, how is it that we, as preachers and as church leaders, model that kind of, of, or create that kind of space for, uh, for being that and feeling that? and not uh, pushing it aside and say, oh, we're back to normal, isn't that great? Uh, I think we do a real disservice. Uh, and, and to say, look at our, our scriptures, give us permission and give us space to do this and acknowledge that. I think that that might be a direction that a preacher needs to take this, this Sunday. All right. Here we are to the, uh, what you called last week, the fundraising part of uh, Second Corinthians, Matt. <laughs> Four of five. It is indeed. Oh. So chapters eight and nine go into the question of the collection Paul is, is raising for the saints in Jerusalem, which is part of the stress between him and the Corinthians. But this is something we know about Paul. He's committed to raising money for the church in Jerusalem. So we can talk about money. We can talk about like what the commentary points out that the, um, the words for grace, for charis are littered all over this passage. They get they get hidden by English translations that use all sorts of different you know, synonyms. But I would say, too, think about what Paul's up to in terms of he's making a theological case for what we call connectionalism or what I call connectionalism. I've never heard um, that word. Of that. That's, well, it's, a, you know, how do, what does one congregation have to do with another one? Mm -hmm. So, you know, are we a congregationalist system? Are we an Episcopal system? We, you know, what kind of system are we? is how we deal with textualism today. But back then, Paul is trying to tell this predominantly Gentile congregation that seems pretty happy to be free from the law and either, any other kinds of constraints. Uh, in the middle of Greece, they actually have a kind of fellowship with, and, and implied in that is a, an, an obligation to a congregation in Jerusalem mm -hmm. that's probably entirely Jewish or almost entirely Jewish. Uh, that has caused trouble for Paul, who was their guy, at least once upon a time in the past, that might not be, they might have heard rumors, isn't so happy about these Gentiles who are, uh, who are living Torah free. And Paul's, Paul's raising money for them. He's telling that what, what goes on in Corinth matters for what goes on in Jerusalem and vice versa. And there's something there that's Paul isn't talking about, about the universal church and the undisputed letters. He doesn't really kind of have that notion of speaking of the church in that kind of a way but here's about as close as he gets of of building connections and in a time when i see a lot of christian congregations around me or nationwide that frankly i want no part of um right i just i really chafe at some of the things that they say do teach there's this reminder of of the unity at the heart of the grace of god that i think i need to hear I'm not sending the money, but I am recognizing this kind of essential connection as much as that makes me mad some days. Well, and I don't know that that's something that we talk about or think about uh, the ways in which uh, communities of faith, individual congregations are radically individualized. It's about their congregation and what, uh, what, what's, what's good for them and what's best for them. And, uh, and, and, uh, but e but even too coming out of uh, coming out of this pandemic on the other side of the pandemic, what does it mean to be church, and how does that, you know, really thinking about 
the question of ecclesiology and how does that connect us? How, how is it that there is a, uh, a different way of, of understanding and thinking about um, that, as you said, connectionalism that, that we haven't thought about, uh, that we haven't thought about in a way that really does matter for how we think about ourselves, our, how do we think about the a congregation as an individual expression of the kingdom of God?